today your first time here, or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you live, we're glad you're here with us today, and we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So, welcome to church. Morning, church. Morning. Morning. I wasn't paying attention to our own countdown. <laughs> it's a beautiful day outside. A little chilly, a little windy, but the sun is shining outside and in here. Amen. Amen. All right. We're glad to see you all here. I was talking to Diane. We were out shopping yesterday, getting some things that we needed, and I looked at her and I said, "Oh no, we've got to go racing shopping next week." And then I thought about it. It's like, oh wait a second. No, that's two weeks. So racing in two weeks. That was a weight off of me. That's our finals. It's going to be a long, busy day, and we're looking forward to seeing everybody show up there. Glad to see everyone here and everyone online. Thank you for joining us this morning. Let's see, what else we got? Oh, hey, this is a month of thanks. We got Thanksgiving coming up this month, and we are uh, preparing some meals that we're going to be delivering to Rem uh, on Thanksgiving Day, correct? Or is it Wednesday evening, the night before. So they have it for Thanksgiving Day. And then Thanksgiving Day, we need to know who's going to come because we're going to share a meal here down in Fellowship Hall. So we're pretty excited about that. So excited that I can't remember details. So not a bad thing at all. Not a bad thing at all. So uh, other things that are coming up. Um, Mark and I met earlier this week and we found out who we needed to contact to get a license to show a movie. It's a Max Lucado movie from 2004 called Christmas Child. Now, I'm not going to give you any spoilers because we saw it several years ago. But it's a really, really good movie. And tentatively set for the second Saturday in December, waiting for approval, uh, of course, from our host here at Huss for that. And then, January, second Saturday in January, another movie. We're going to skip the every three months thing. In fact, we're going to make a special... Uh, piece for our every other decision that we made every other month. We're going to do one special one for Christmas. So please join us for that one. And then in January, an amazing movie. If you haven't seen it, you got to come. If you've already seen it, you got to come again because it's called Do You Believe? It's an amazing, amazing movie. Um, last time I saw it was about five years ago. I remember that because it was the same time frame as when my mom passed. It's a great movie. All I can go out to our website, click on the events tab, go to movies. There's a, tr a link for both of them to watch the trailer so you can see what more about what they're about. But the one thing I remember about Do I Believe is the pastor that walks the streets with his cross. And he just, I mean, he's just walking around, he's talking to people, and he's, he's sharing the gospel. It's, boy, this is really going to kick off our next four weeks as well uh, because we're going to be going through the solos. We kind of talked a little bit about that on uh, Wednesday night. I'm excited for today. I know we're going to be talking, Pastor Mark's going to be talking about grace. And, and, not, and not the, the church name, but what grace is. And, and I'm really excited to hear that today. So before we get any further, let's go ahead and go into our call to worship this morning, which comes from Hebrews chapter 9. It's the last two verses. It's verses 27 and 28. And this is what... The writer of Hebrews writes, he says, And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment. So also Christ died once 
for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who eagerly are waiting for him. Now, this first part is a, we're destined to die once, a physical death once. And for a lot of us out there, if you don't have the hope that we have, that's a scary thought. And that's why we're so passionate about bringing God's message, bringing the message of this, this love letter from God to you. And so, uh, the thing here is it also says that Jesus died once. He came in human form and died just like we do, but he had a different assignment. He, he came to take away our sins. Now, when he comes back again, he's coming back for our salvation because he's already taken care of the sin problem. And Mark is talking... I've heard it said many different ways, and the way Mark says it is the one that sticks with me the most. It's, it's taking and going to that cross and taking all that luggage, all that garbage that you have, and just setting it at the foot of the cross. But when you put it there, walk away. Don't go back. Because that is going to get in your way. And, and this also talks about judgment. Judgment, nobody likes to hear judgment these days. We've got, we've got an anger problem. <laughs> And we need to understand that. And let's, let's understand that with the hope that we have, we don't have to be afraid of that judgment. Because, you know, when, when, somebody, does, when somebody gets a, a sentence in the courts, they appeal that to a higher court or to an appellate court. Well, we have gone through Jesus to the highest court anywhere. That's to God. And he has pardoned us. Put your hope in Jesus. Father, just thank you for the message that you've given Pastor Mark this morning. Father, we pray for every word to come out of his mouth that it is one from you, Father, and that it, it settles in our minds and in our hearts. And it, it's not something that we just hear for a feel-good story, but one that prompts us to action. Not one that, that just puts us on a plateau, Father, but one that prompts us to action. Once we hear the message today, from the moment we finish hearing the final words and the final words of the music that today, that we immediately start living the message you have for us. Thank you, Father, for Pastor Mark and the message that you have given him today. May it be powerful and may it reach an untold number of people. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Amen to that, Pastor Terry. Wow, what a beautiful day today. You know, yesterday was really kind of blustery and high winds and cold. And so we had a guy that was coming out to give us an estimate on our roof and one for dad's place yesterday. And so he hadn't got out there right away. And so I got a ladder out and I went to my flagpole and I had to change out flags. And you know, you're reaching up like this and your shirt just isn't quite long enough. Whew, I gotta tell you, that wind cuts through immediately. But what a gorgeous and beautiful day it is today. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And so today we're gonna talk about our means to grace. And what that means is we have a pathway to get to grace. And the name of our church is Grace Street Church. And there's a purpose behind it because we're helping to usher people along that pathway to get to God's grace. And so as we study this today, as, as Pastor Terry was mentioning, we're gonna talk about the five solas and the five solas came out of Reformation, the Reformation movement back in the 1500s. And today is Reformation Sunday. So it's kind of a neat thing. When I was planning out the message for today, I was kind of looking at, well, what can we do that, that really will drive the point home and to clarify things about one of the five solas, which is sola gracia, or grace alone. 
And so we're going to talk about that today. And as, as we went through that call to worship this morning, uh, I was super excited because Terry hit it right on the m money. There are kind of two parts to those scriptures that were read today. And one is that we are going to die a death. We're, we're all going to die that physical death. And it's just going to happen. And it's inevitable. Everybody's going to have that happen. But, but, Christ died a single death, but is coming back. Now, Terry talked about the judgment and, and the difference. We have judgment and salvation. And the neat thing with Christ is when he comes back, it's not to judge us for our sins. That's already been done. Those sins are forgiven. When we lay the sins at the bottom of the cross, at the foot of the cross, and we leave them there, it's done. It's over with. Once we accept Christ into our heart, we repent of our sins, which means we give them to God. We repent of those. We give those sins over to God. It's done. We're washed clean. They don't exist anymore. So when we keep dragging them back and dragging them back and we ask for that same forgiveness over and over again, we're saying, well, God, I don't believe you did your work right the first time around. So I have to keep bringing them back to you. And God says, no, it's done. It is finished. Those were the words that Christ uttered from the cross that day. It is finished. Meaning, once you bring those sins to the foot of my cross, once you commit your life to me, it's finished. Your sins are as far as the east is from the west. And as the Casting Crown song goes, it's one scarred hand to another. What Christ did for us. Those sins that separated us from God are gone. So therefore, when Christ comes back, it's for salvation. It's to bring us home, to be with him, to be with God for all eternity. What a great promise. So when we take a look at this, if we don't really break down some of the scriptures sometimes, we read through these things and, oh, well, it's kind of neat and, you know, but when we really stop to think about what's going on there, it brings on that whole new meaning. And that's what we're trying to do as we guide you down Grace Street to get you to that means of grace. So God's grace and mercy, we hear those terms a lot in Christianity, in the church, and when we're talking to people, we're, we always talk about grace and we always talk about mercy. And a lot of times people kind of get confused and don't really know what the difference is between them. So, God's grace and mercy. Mercy has been defined as God giving us what we do, God not giving us what we do deserve. So, for the things that we're doing wrong, his mercy says, no, no, you're not going to get eternal punishment for this. I have mercy for you. And so it's not giving us what we truly deserve. And grace is similar to that. And grace is defined as God giving us what we do not deserve. So those things that we don't earn, those things that we can't just go out and, and get on our own. God gives us gifts and he lavishes us with these free gifts. No strings attached. We didn't have to do anything for him. God gives us those things that we do not deserve. His undeserved, earned, unearned favor that we get. His gifts include salvation, the forgiveness of sins, endurance, strengthening, and encouragement. The virtues that he develops within us and a host of other things. And we talked about that a few months back when we were talking about the gifts of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit. And so we kind of talk about some of those gifts that God lavishes upon us. Those things that he gives us so that we can build up our lives so that we can be edified, as the scripture actually says, that we can be edified through him. And so these gifts that we have are to build us up and to build up a defenses against the world that would seek to tear those things down and separate us from God. So that grace has a lot of meaning to it. It's just not an empty word. It means a lot of things. And so today I thought, you know, some people get kind of caught up in, in the words 
and don't really understand the meeting. So I've got a couple stories that as I go through the uh, message this morning here, I'm going to impart those. And the first one is about a young Billy Graham, and he was driving through a small southern town, and he was pulled over and charged with speeding by a policeman. And moreover than that, but he, he told the policeman, well, yeah, I was speeding, and, and even though he admitted his guilt, the officer said, well, you're going to have to go to court and appear in court because you were going over 10 miles per hour over the limit. So he had to go to court. And at first, the judge didn't recognize Graham when he walked in, and he, said, he asked him flat out, he says, guilty or not guilty? And when Graham pleaded guilty, the judge replied, well, that'll be $10, a dollar for every mile you went over the speed limit. But see, suddenly, the judge recognized who he was. And he recognized that this is Billy Graham, who's, who's a, a really important pastor, a minister, an evangelist, someone who brings people home to God. And so he says, well, you have violated the law, the judge said, and the fine must be paid but I am going to pay it for you. That he took a $10 billet from his own wallet and he paid the ticket, attached it to the paperwork and turned it in. And then on top of that, he went out and bought Billy Graham a steak dinner. And then later, Billy Graham said, this is how God treats repentant sinners. And my story is a story of true grace. This is a true story. This is how God's grace works. Even though we're guilty, it isn't incumbent upon us to pay that fine. See, God sent his own son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But moreover, that he justified us with a justifying grace through Christ who died for our sins. See, there's a lot of different types of grace, and it's been defined out. And if you ever go to the walk of Emmaus, they have different talks on every one of these types of grace. And this justifying grace that God sent his son to die for us, so that when we take those sins and we place them at the foot of the cross, they're gone. They're gone. Because Christ died and took those sins upon himself so that we didn't have to pay the cost. He paid the cost for us. So if you can understand that simple story then, you can understand what my message is about today. And this morning's message is really going to be centered around Ephesians 2, 5 through 10. So if you have your Bibles or a Bible resource in front of you, you know, try and follow along, and it'll, I'll kind of reference back to it as we go. But please pay really close attention, because this is a great set of verses that talks about God's grace. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our own sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. And this is what I was talking about. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved from those sins. That's where the first part of grace comes in. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Jesus Christ. Which means when we became believers in Christ and we accepted Christ into our hearts, we became one with him, and we are seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father. So God can point us to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Jesus Christ. Here's the neat part. God saved you by his grace when you believe. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpieces. 
He has created us anew in Jesus Christ so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Wow, what an awesome message. What an awesome promise. If we would take just these verses to heart, think about how much better our lives would be and the lives of those around us. See, God's grace is that gift. And the only way we can do it, the only way that we can be saved is through and by the grace of God, through our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is what I talked about a couple of sermons ago when I was talking about, you know, we have to believe it, we have to receive it into our hearts. And as Terry also reiterated this morning, then we have to live it out. We have to know, grow, and go. I talked about that on Wednesday night. And there's a reason for it. It's because God wants us to put our faith in action. You know, we, he gave us all these great gifts, and we talked about that before. You don't keep the gift. You don't keep that package all wrapped up. You open that package up, and you get to see what that gift is. And then you get to use that gift. But if we just get given a gift, and we go, ooh, that's a neat gift. It comes from God. I'm going to keep it just like that. I'm going to set it off the side so it doesn't get dirty, doesn't get tarnished. No, God wants us to open up that gift, receive it to ourselves, and then live it out on a daily basis. See, that gift was Jesus. That gift was salvation. That gift was forgiveness of sins. We have to believe it, receive it, and live it out in order for it to do anyone any good. Grace without any kind of works beside it is no good. Gift sitting in a box unopened is no good. So we have to put our faith into action. And God doesn't take us out of the world or make us into these sinless robots when we, when we accept Christ into our lives. We still feel like sinning and sometimes we will sin, but see the difference is that before we became Christians, we were dead and slaves to our sinful nature. But now, but now, once we got that gift from Christ, once we believed and we received it through Christ, we are alive with Christ. We are alive with Christ. That is grace alive and working within us. Through faith in Christ, we stand acquitted, not guilty before God. So when that judgment comes, because we've accepted Christ, because we believe faith, because we believe in Christ, and we believe that he did take away our sins, at that point in time, guess what? We're not guilty. Not guilty. So when we come before that judge, he takes the money out of his own wallet and he pays our ticket. He pays our ticket. But he doesn't stop there. What's he say? Well, more than I'm just going to pay that ticket, I have come and I have prepared a place for you to be with me for eternity. That is God's grace. Unearned favor unearned gifts, not by our works, but by the grace of God. So when we take a look at grace, and we take a look at mercy, and we take a look at these things, and when we think of God's grace, we, under, we need to understand that God's grace is given to us through agape love, a love that's unconditional and infinite. No matter who we are, no matter what we've done, God's love is there for us regardless of who we are and what we've done. See, we are presented, we are presented as sinless before God. And that comes through faith. So when someone gives a gift to you, do you say, hey, that's very nice. Now, how much do I owe you? How much do I owe you? You ever say that to somebody when they give you a gift? Well, no, no. The appropriate thing is to say, thank you. Thank you. 
Yet how often as we as Christians, after being given a gift of salvation, feel obligated to try and work our way to God at that point in time. See, our, part of our human nature is we know that we are sin and by ourselves are not worthy of God's presence. By ourselves, we are not worthy of God's grace and mercy. But see, that's where your faith comes in. Once we believe and once we have that faith in a living God, in Jesus, and we take it in, we receive it to ourselves and we put it in our heart, our holy of holies within our bodies. He sends us a gift of the Holy Spirit to live within us. That's God's way of saying, I got more to come. I got more to come. Then as we build that relationship with God, as we become closer to God, as we study his word, a living and eternal word. See, as we do all those things, then God strengthens that relationship that we have with him. He strengthens it. He makes it bigger. He makes it better. He gives us more gifts. That's grace. Unearned favor is what the scriptures call it. Unearned favor. Wow. Wow. We got a lot to look forward to. What all do we have to do to get there? No works to be done. All we have to do is believe it and receive it and live it out. That's it. That's all we have to do. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Pretty good. So our salvation and even our faith are gifts from God. So what we need to do as Christians is we need to respond to those gifts with gratitude, praise, joy. The last Advent, we kind of broke down all those things and we went through each tenet of what Advent is about. Hey, peace, hope, joy, love, all founded in Christ, our relationship, our faith with Christ. So it's awesome, absolutely awesome, when we get to do those things. And we become Christians through God's unmerited grace, not as the result of any effort, ability, or intelligent choice, or an act of service on our part. In spite of those things, however, out of gratitude, God gives us this free gift. But we need to seek to help and serve others with that same gifts that we got. Kindness, love, gentleness, peace, patience. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Yeah. We talked about that when we talked about the fruits of the Spirit. God living within us will allow us to treat others differently. When I opened up, I kind of talked about that. Once we understand grace, how it works, we believe it and receive it and we start living it out. Guess what? Your life gets better. Doesn't mean we're going to be you know, perfect. Doesn't mean we're not going to face trials. We all know what that's all about. But what it does say is it says that through God's unmerited favor and love for us, he helps us serve others. That Grace Street Church, we're helping people on the pathway to get to God's grace, to get to that relationship, that one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. And while no action or work that we can do will help us to obtain salvation, God's intention is that our salvation will result in acts of service toward others. Ooh. We can't work our way to get there because it's a free gift from God. You don't work for gifts. You don't work for gifts. But see, once you're given that gift, then we can put it into action and we can help others as a result. And that's what God's unmerited favor is all about. So we're not saved merely for our own benefit, but to serve Christ and to build up the church. And I'm not talking about the building. I'm 
not talking about a physical structure. I'm talking about the body of believers, your friends, your relatives, your kids. If they don't know God, they don't know this gift of grace, they don't know God's mercy, we should bring them to be with us. We should give them that gift of God's favor, of his agape love, unconditional and infinite love. A love that doesn't go away no matter what. That's incumbent upon us as getting that free gift is to turn around and give gifts out ourselves by the grace of God. And see, that is the means of grace. That's what it's all about. So there's another story, and I'm going to tell you another story this morning, so you don't get bored just listening to me up here talking. So it's a really good story, and it makes a good point about salvation by grace. And listen to it carefully, because it's really important to understand the principles behind it. So this man dies, and he goes to heaven. Or it could be a woman. The admittance angel meets him at the pearly gates, and the angel says, here's how it works. You need 100 points to make it into heaven. You tell me all the good things that you've done, and I'll give you a certain number of points for each item, and when you, when you reach 100 points, hey, you get in. Well, okay, the man says. I was faithfully married to the same woman for 50 years. The angel goes, wow, that's wonderful. Wow, that's wonderful. That's worth one point. One point, he says. Uh, well, I attended church all my life and supported its ministry with my tithe and, tithe and service. And the angel says, wow. Well, that's certainly worth a point. One point? What, what do you mean, one point? Oh, uh, well, how about this? I started up a soup kitchen in my city, and I worked in a shelter for homeless veterans. Fantastic, said the angel. That's good for one half more point. The man looks at it. One half point? Well, at this rate, the only way I'm going to get into heaven is by the grace of God. The angel says, now you understand. Now you understand. See, the only way to get into heaven is by the grace of God. Not by what we do, not by what we say in our time here on earth. But it's by the grace of God. And it's a free gift given when we believe and we receive. See, but there's a problem with this joke is you need to understand that God's grace is there for you before you die. You have to receive it and you have to believe it and you have to live it out before you die. That guy got up there and didn't have what it takes. He never got to that 100 points. Of course, points are worthless and irrelevant. But he had to have God's grace before you die. So last week I asked the question, and I want you to think about that, is if your heart stopped beating today, would you be good with God? And of course, when we die, there are no second chances. There are no second chances. So we saw that in, the, in our call to worship this morning in Hebrews 9, 27, and it says, Inasmuch as it is pointed for men to die once, after this comes judgment. Through the grace of God, Jesus sits at the right hand of God and pleads our case for him. Back in and this is really going to date me, but back in 1965, we had this gospel quartet that came to church and sang at church. And one of the songs that has absolutely stuck with me, and I guess one of the reasons why is 
this bass singer that I heard had the lowest voice I'd ever heard as a kid. And I really love that because uh, I've, I've sang bass for years, but I've got a five octave range, but I, I love singing bass. And, and one of the things we had over at the other church that we had was I had this awesome sound system set up. And when I would go down all the way down to an F, uh, off the end of the charts on the piano keys, if you will, as our pastor said, um, it would actually literally shake the floor in the building. But see, they sang this song and it touched my heart. And the name of the song was, Sorry, I Never Knew You. Sorry, I Never Knew You. And the song was all about this guy who didn't go to church, didn't have a living God inside his household. His family and his kids, they all went to Sunday school, they all went to church, they all became faithful believers. But see, when he died, he came up there and God said, sorry, I never knew you. Go and serve the one you served while back on earth. Sorry, I never knew you. That stuck with me. Because, see, we're all going to die once. And if we have faith in Christ, we have God's grace and mercy to look forward to. And as much as it is pointed for men to die once and then after this comes judgment, through the grace of God, Jesus sits at the right hand of God pleading for us. He can only do that if he knows us. He can only do that. The last thing you want is to die and go to heaven and say, sorry, I never knew you. Go and serve the one that you served while back on earth. Wow. Now, we don't want that for our friends and our family or actually for anyone else. And see, that's where it comes into us living out our faith. Being able to share the word of God with others. Taking them on that grace street to salvation, to God, to that relationship with Jesus. So again... I asked the question that I asked last week. If your heart stopped beating today, would you be good with God? In other words, if you died today, do you have that assurance that you will go to heaven? And when you get to heaven, they're going to know who you are. Wow. Wow. Are they going to know who you are? Only by the grace of God do we get into heaven. See, most of us would quickly question our faith when I ask that question. Hmm. It's a natural action. Do I have enough faith to believe? The scripture tells us this, that it only takes faith the size of a mustard seed to move a mountain. Anybody know how big a mustard seed is? Half a millimeter. Oh, absolutely right. It's teeny, teeny, tiny. It doesn't take a lot of faith to move an entire mountain. Which means it is very, very simple for us to believe and have faith in God. He didn't make it this magnanimous chore that we have to undertake. But faith the size of a mustard seed. Faith the size of a mustard seed. Believe, receive, and live it out. So God isn't asking for much. By grace, he grants us our eternal life with Jesus. If we understand God's grace, then it becomes more clear. And hopefully by my descriptions that I've given you, by the message so far this morning, you should have a lot better understanding of what grace is and what it's all about. And I talked about it that we were in the Sunday here of the Reformation movement, or called Reformation Sunday. 
And our current understanding of grace is a directly a product of that Protestant Reformation that went on. The Reformation movement was a movement that began in the 1500s and sought to reform the traditions and beliefs of the Roman Catholicism that was being taught in those days. As a matter of fact, Martin Luther, who penned his 95 Theses back in those days, did it 501 years ago this very day. This very day. The primary founders of the Reformation were names that are familiar to us, such as Martin Luther and John Calvin and Jan Hus, which this church is named after. And primarily the movement was spawned out of an outrage for the practices and teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. In particular, it was to the papal authority that was given to the Pope. And it was arising from what was viewed as perceived errors that they were teaching in comparison to God's Word, the Scriptures corrupt doctrines that were made by men under the church and abuses and discrepancies of scriptural integrity and authority by the Catholic Church. And so Martin Luther went and he wrote 95 theses, theories, examples, well thought out, well written out of why these are not scripturally Correct. These practices are not scripturally correct. And out of the Reformation came five solas. And Terry kind of touched on that a little bit earlier this morning. And over the next four weeks, we're going to be going through uh, the five solas, or at least four out of the five, because I did one of them back in June when I talked about when I talked about the grace alone. And I talked about glory to God only. And so the five solas are Latin phrases that collectively served as the foundational principles of the Protestant Reformation movement. And the five solas identified distinctive theological positions held by the reformers to continue to serve as distinguishing characteristics of the reformed theology. And what does that mean? That means that we took these things as saying these are the absolute basic tenets that our principles are founded on, the Protestant principles. And these five solas are sola scriptura, or the scriptures alone are the word of God. The scriptures alone are the word of God. And sola Christus, Christ alone, is our means to grace. Christ alone. Sola gratia, which we're going through today. By grace alone can we make it into heaven. Sola fide, or by faith alone, can we receive these gifts of Christ. And sola deo gloria, glory to God only. Only. So when we pray, we pray to God. We pray to Jesus, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all one. We don't pray to someone else. We pray to God alone. That was one to us. Our separation from God was won by Christ's death on the cross. So these five crucial truths reclaimed by the Reformers form the basis of of what we base our Protestant religion on. Let me give you a quick example of each one. Sola Scriptura, the Bible alone is our highest authority. The Bible is our ultimate authority for understanding God. Sola Christus, Christ alone. Christ Jesus alone is our Lord, our Savior, and our King. God is gracious but he is also holy and just. In order for sinners to be justified, that justifying grace to be given, these sins must be accounted for. And this was accomplished through the sinless life, sacrificial death, and bodily resurrection of Jesus. 
The atoning death of Jesus Christ is the only means by which we can attain forgiveness for our sins. No purgatory, no buy-downs, no nothing. Once and for all, forgiven on the cross. Soli Deo Gloria. To the glory of God alone. We live for the glory of God alone. All things, including the justification of sinners and the lives of believers, are created for the purpose of bringing glory to God. At Revelation 4.11 And as stated in the Western Catechism in there, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Enjoy Him forever. So this Reformed theology teaches that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ to the glory of God alone. And furthermore, the Bible is our authoritative source for understanding this and all other aspects of our faith. These biblical truths that are in the Bible are succinctly captured in these five solas. So if you want to boil down the truths of the Bible, these five solas are what really do it. They are the basis by which everything else we do within our church, with a capital C, within our church and our belief system is what it's based on. But our foundation, our foundation for it all, believes within our faith. In Christ and accepting Christ into our life, receiving Him in and then living it out. So today we've been looking at sola gratia. And as we heard in the beginning of our sermon today, grace refers to God lavishing us with these free gifts, His undeserved and unearned favor. It isn't by works, it isn't by what we do, as we had from that story about the guy showing up and boy he did a lot of great things you know he did a lot of great things but that's not enough to get you into heaven it's by faith by the grace of God alone that we get into, into heaven so his gifts include salvation the forgiveness of sins endurance and strengthening and encouragement the virtues he develops in us as we form this relationship with God. And see, we get that other whole host of fruits of the Spirit and those other gifts that come along. And those are kind of the icing on the cake or the big bow on top of the package of that gift that we were given. Acts 17, 24 through 28 said, He is the God who made the world and everything in it. And since He is the Lord of heaven and earth, He doesn't live in a man-made temple. And human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need from one man. He created all nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and when they should fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. So God alone decides these things. By the grace of God and by his mercy, we're allowed to live within his earth. Our time is finite. finite. We're only going to live so long. If your heart stops beating today, do you have that assurance that you're going to be with God? Or is he going to say, sorry, I never knew you. So here in Acts, Paul explained that one true God to all these educated people in Athens, Rome. Greece, sorry. And to the Roman church. And so these men were, in general, very religious people. Very religious people. But see, the problem was they didn't have a personal
personal relationship with God. They didn't know God. They didn't know the grace of a sovereign God. Likewise, today we live in a Christian society. A Christian society, but you see, the problem is, to most people, God is still unknown. They may know the name God, but they don't know God. And likewise, does God know them? Does God know them? That's the most important part. We need to proclaim who he is and make clear what he did for everyone through his son, Jesus. And that this act of grace born out of love, this agape love that is infinite and undeserved. And mercy and love and grace is born out of God's love for us, that unending favor and undeserved favor. We can't assume that even though religious people around us truly know or understand the importance of faith in Christ, or that salvation is only through the grace of God alone, and there's many who today are familiar with God, but they don't have that relationship. And our first point then is to seek out God first in all that we say and all that we do. We are the living representation of Christ. Represent Christ. That's our job. That's what we as Christians are to do is we were God's representatives here on earth as Christians, as believers in the faith. We need to represent Christ to all that don't know him. Because it's only through the grace of God by faith in Jesus that they are saved. We need to receive God to us, believe in him, and then live it out in our lives. And I keep saying that over and over and over again because nothing is more important than those three tenets. We have salvation by God's saving grace in contrast to our works. See, my works alone by standing up here and giving God's message is still not enough to get me into heaven. If I don't have faith and if I don't believe, if I don't receive Christ to myself, and if I don't live it out on a daily basis, I'll get up to heaven and guess what? Sorry, I never knew you. But by having that relationship, it's a game changer. Everything changes. When we talk about sola gracia, this by grace alone we can get into God. God's saving grace as it relates to salvation. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not that of your own volition. In spite of who we are and in spite of what we've done, that we are saved by grace. It is the gift of God. So that verse in Ephesians 2, that God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for it. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. Masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the things that he planned for us in our lives long ago. Human pride resents the fact that we cannot merit our own salvation, which means we can't earn our own salvation. We want to be considered worthy of salvation. But see, God's unmerited favor, meaning it's not what we do. It's only that we have that relationship and only that God loves us that we can have salvation. But we think we have to earn that salvation. An important part of what we call repentance, and we talked about repentance here a while back. See, part of repentance is we have to humble ourselves. We have to humble ourselves. I talked about that in June when I was talking about grace. And we were talking about the fruits of the Spirit. And one of the things was that humbleness of spirit. That's one of the gifts he gives us so that we don't let pride stand in our way. 
of that relationship with God. And some people are really, really good at helping others out, but when they need help, but they are too proud to ask for help themselves when they need it. And that's part of that humbling process. That's part of that humbling process. We have to be open. We have to open ourselves up to those around us, those brothers and sisters in Christ, so they can help lift us up out of the problems that we face. We kind of had that Wednesday night, and I want to thank you for that. From the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you. That is faith in action. Absolutely faith in action. And you should be, I hate to use the word, proud of yourselves. Because you're doing exactly what God wants. Sometimes our biggest stumbling block when it comes to grace is ourselves. We stand in our own way. We need to believe what we believe. And we talked about that when we were talking about God's love for us. God loves us because he loves us. It isn't who we are. It isn't what we've done. It isn't because we're cute or we got a great hairdo. God loves us because he loves us. Therefore, it says in James 4, 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. See, once we get pride out of the way and we remove that barrier from us, to have a relationship to God, and we humble ourselves before this loving God. He lavishes us with gifts. That's what I love about that scripture. He lavishes us with gifts. That means he pours them out. And there's a song that maybe we'll hear today uh, from Todd Agnew, of grace like rain falls down upon me. And I just love that picture. You know, of grace falling down. It's just raining down. Just soaking us with God's grace. So three tenets to understanding God's grace at work in us are, number one, we must accept that we are by ourselves spiritually bankrupt. By ourselves alone, we can do nothing and we have nothing to offer. So that's point number one. Point number two is God's saving grace is irresistible to those whom God has prepared. If our hearts are prepared by the Holy Spirit and we have that relationship, then God's grace is irresistible. We want more. We want more. Have you ever had that wonderful experience of, of going in and, and just feeling God's spirit at work within you? And you get this warm feeling that just flows through you. And that grace becomes irresistible. You, you want more. you got to have more. And see, that's God at work in your lives. John 6, 37 and 44 says that all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And that's that irresistible force that God is going to put on our hearts to seek out God first. In all things. Point number three is the atoning death of Jesus was the means by which God came to offer us that free offer of grace by salvation. That salvation by grace. The means to grace is through Christ alone. Solus Christus. And we'll be going that over that in much, much deeper detail here in a couple. So I've heard it explained this way, God's riches at Christ's expense. And see, I think that's spot on. So in conclusion, today I started with this, that God's grace could be defined as this. God gives us what we don't deserve, while mercy could be defined as God doesn't give us what we do deserve. We are saved by grace and not by works. And that that's why the gospel is such a good news. See, the word gospel means 
good news. That's what that word means. And that's such good news because if we had to depend on works alone, none of us could ever make it into heaven. And none of us could ever be sure that we're done enough good works to save ourselves. That's why the message on grace is so important. That's why we named our church Grace Street Church, is to be able to bring people that unmerited favor of God, to help us drive them back home to God. See, it's all free for us, but it was the utmost expense to God. What we could never have achieved alone comes freely to all those who come to the table of Christ. We need to understand that grace is free, but it is costly. When Jesus shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins, there was no greater cost that has ever been paid because here was a sinless God man who died for sinful human Romans 5, 6 through 10. It is re free to receive it, but it wasn't free to God to give it. It came at the expense of his own son. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Therefore, we cannot and should not waste the grace that we have been given. So as we receive grace, so should we give grace. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, it is by your grace that we can be here alive today. It is by your grace that we hear your word. And it will be by your grace that we humble ourselves before you. We receive your word into our hearts. We believe in your son, Jesus. Lord, we will live out this grace that you have given us. We will remember the blood sacrificed on the cross to give us that means to salvation, that means to grace, that can only come through faith in you. Shatter our hardened hearts today, open our ears to hear, our eyes to see the wonders and the glory of your world that you have prepared for us. In Jesus' name. Start out the song there, Pastor Mark. Come to the table. Mm. And that's what we're doing right now. We're coming to God's table to celebrate Christ's last meal with his disciples. drawn into Galatians at this point. In Galatians 5, starting at verse 4, it says, For if you are trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have cut off, you are cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised us. For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. He told the disciples, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. In the same way, later in the meal, he took the cup. And after filling it, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for the sins of many. Take and drink. And the scriptures remind us as often as we do this, we do so in remembrance of him. And when, you know, when I was little, I always wondered, I never understood 
until I was like in middle school, what it, this saying on the front of the communion table said, in remembrance of him. We do this in remembrance of what Jesus did for us. We thank God for his sacrifice, the body and the blood of Jesus. If you have your cup, go ahead and remove the wafer. You can go ahead and take the, the seal off. If you don't have a cup and you're at home and you would like to take communion with us each Sunday, please let us know. Put it in the comments. Shoot us an email at info at gracestreet.church. Call us. Phone number's on our website. Leave us a message if we don't answer. We will get those delivered to you. We want you to be a part. Even though you can't be with us in person, we want you to be a part of this service all the way in, into including communion. The body and blood of Jesus. Father, thank you for what this meal represents. And that each time that we come together, that we celebrate this meal, it is, as Mark said, through grace alone. It is a, an, a gift. And we cannot leave it unopened. Open it. Receive it, believe it, and do it. Go out and live out your Thank you, Father, that you have given us this opportunity. In Jesus' name. Agape time, and if anyone has prayers that they would like to talk about or God sightings of any kind. <laughs> All right, well, I'll talk about my niece Misty then. Um, Misty's son David was supposed to have surgery last week, I believe, and it was the icy day on Tuesday that he was supposed to have it. And um, they canceled the surgery, uh, one, because they tested him for COVID before his surgery. He's only two, and he tested positive but he has no symptoms whatsoever, and he will be able to have surgery in two to three weeks. And, you know, I'm just so proud of Misty because when she was pregnant, they told her that she should have an abortion because he was born without a diaphragm. And she ministered to all the doctors and all the nurses and told them that she was not going to have an abortion, that it was God's choice whether he live or die. And every day, is a blessing for her and you know I'm just so proud that she had that faith to you know go ahead and have David and, and yes he's had surgeries and but he's the happiest little boy for a two-year-old that you know he plays and he's happy and he's, he's healthy most of the time and he'll have to have surgeries off and on throughout his life but um, she's just an amazing woman and I'm very proud of her and so um, I guess you know, I'm just grateful, and we shouldn't be thankful every day that God gives us breath to live out each and every day. No matter what it is, no matter what trials we go through, God is always with us. So let us go to God in prayer. Father God, I thank you today for every breath and heartbeat you give us, that um, you can use us to serve you each and every day, to talk to others, to be your hands and feet to do your service in your will, Lord, and help us to let it be your will in our lives that we do, not our will. So thank you for this beautiful day. I pray for all those that are in need. Um, I pray for my friend Chris. She's having surgery on um, Tuesday for her back surgery. So be with the doctors and uh, guide them and just help them to be on their A game and do the best they can for Chris, Lord Jesus. And I pray that her recovery will be quickly and then she'll have a knee surgery in three or four weeks so uh, just prayers for her and, and prayers for all those that are in need just be with them and comfort them today and just put loved ones around them and christian people in their path 
so that they may find you, Lord God, and help them to open up the Bible and read the verses in the Bible, because that is life to their, to their soul and, uh, and breath. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' holy name. Thank you, Denise, for those words. And if you do have prayer requests or praises that you would like to have lifted up, uh, we do have a prayer service that we do on Wednesday evenings. Uh, feel free to get those sent in to us here at Grace Street Church. We'll be more than happy to intercede and to pray and to lift the people up to edify them in the name of the Lord. Uh, this does end our on-air portion of our service today. Uh, for those who would like to see the entire service, um, tune in to gracestreet.church and uh, we'll be having the full uh, service online there as well. Thanks again and may God bless you.